Welcome to a journey that will transport you to a world of wonder and history. Get ready to explore the enchanting and mysterious castles of Africa, from the grassland of Zimbabwe to the rugged highlands of Ethiopia, Africa's castles hold stories that have stood the test of time, get ready to explore, get ready for Africa castles. 1. Fazal Gebi The Fazal Gebi is a fortress located in Gondar, Amhara region, Ethiopia. It was founded in the 17th century by Emperor Fazalides and was the home of Ethiopian emperors. Because of its historical importance and architecture, the fortress was inscribed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1979. Gebi is an Amharic word for a compound or enclosure. The complex of buildings includes Fazalides Castle, Ayasuai's Palace, Dawit Third Hall, Empress Mentwab's Castle, a chancellery and library from Johannes I, a banqueting hall from the Emperor Bakafa, stables, and three churches, Asasaim Kedis Michael, Elfine Georgis and Jemjabet Mariam. The origins of the Fazal Gebi can be found in the old tradition of Ethiopian emperors traveling around their possessions, living off the produce of the peasants and dwelling in tents. Reflecting this connection, this precinct was frequently referred to as a katama, camp, or fortified settlement, the name applied to the imperial camp in the royal chronicle of Beda Maryam. Emperor Fazalides broke with this tradition of progressing through the territories and founded the city of Gondar as his capital, its relative permanence makes the city historically important. Within the capital, Fazalides ordered the construction of an imposing edifice, the Fazal Gem or Fazalides Castle. According to a Yemeni traveler, Hassan Ibn Ahmad al Haimi, who visited the palace in 1648 when it was only a few years old, one of architects was an Indian named Abdul Karim who had previously worked on the palace of Emperor Susenio's I in Dankas. According to Merid Wolda Arge, the castle was built by Ethiopian masons who were likely assisted by Indian craftsmen. However, he emphasizes that the Portuguese contribution was marginal, stating that their minor involvement was due to the expulsion of the Jesuits by Fazalides in 1634. Al Haimi, who was greatly impressed with the palace, describes it as a great house of stone and lime and one of marvelous of buildings, worthy of admiration. And the most beautiful of outstanding wonders, the palace served as the residence of the royal family. An Armenian merchant named Koja Murad visited the imperial palace in 1696 and claimed that they were at least 80 royal children who ran around indiscriminately. Aside from the main palace, subsequent emperors such as Bakafa, Ayasuai and Mentwab built their own structures around the imperial compound expanding it considerably. Visiting the Fazal Gebi in the late 1950s, Thomas Pakenham observed that, dotted among the palaces are what remains of the pavilions and kiosks of the imperial city, a large number of the buildings at Fazal Gebi did not survive the events of the time. But the place is still rich in buildings that were renovated both by the Italian occupiers in the late 1930s and after Ethiopia regained its independence. The site was declared a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 1979, which stated in its decision that it faithfully represents modern Ethiopian civilization at north of Lake Tana which appeared in the early 17th century and influenced Ethiopian architecture for many years. Fazal Gebi also includes the Fazalides Baths, a construction which is also attributed to Emperor Fazalides, and the imperial complex of Empress Mentwab in Kuskam, which is considered one of the most important tourist destinations in the country. Fazal Gebi covers an area of about 70,000 square meters. To its south lies Adababe, the marketplace of Gondar, where imperial proclamations were made, troops presented, and criminals executed, it is currently a city park. Dawit's Hall is in the northern part of the enclosure, adjacent to the building attributed to Bakafa and the church of Asa Sain Kedis Michael. Often referred to as the House of Song, House of the Divan, or House of the Throne, as Zafan Bet, House of Song. 
Monroe Hay describes it as a substantial one-story building with a round tower at the southeast corner, with traces of a smaller round tower at the northeast corner and traces of a square tower at the northwest corner, most of which has collapsed. The interior of the building is a single long hall, which the usual arched windows and doorways provided light and access. As of 2002, Dawit's Hall lacks a roof. Fazl Gebi is enclosed by a 900-meter long curtain wall which is pierced by 12 gates. 2. Great Zimbabwe When archaeologists first visited Great Zimbabwe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they refused to even consider the possibility that this monumental stone fortress was constructed by indigenous Africans. But what was early on attributed to the likes of the ancient Egyptians or the Queen of Sheba was indigenous a spectacular series of three architectural groups with features like conical towers, balconies, and monolithic sculptures. Today, the consensus among scholars and Zimbabweans, alike, is that construction began at Zimbabwe's castle complex as early as the 11th century by ancestors of the modern Shona ethnic group. A center of trade for at least 300 years, this royal city now in ruins, once had a population of 18,000 people, the majority of scholars believe that it was built by members of the Gokumir culture, who were the ancestors of the modern Shona in Zimbabwe. The Great Zimbabwe area was settled by the 4th century AD. Between the 4th and the 7th centuries, communities of the Gokumir or Ziwa cultures farmed the valley, and mined and worked iron, but built no stone structures. These are the earliest Iron Age settlements in the area identified from archaeological diggings, construction of the stone buildings started in the 11th century and continued for over 300 years. The ruins at Great Zimbabwe are some of the oldest and largest structures located in southern Africa, and are the second oldest after nearby Mpungabwe in South Africa. Its most formidable edifice, commonly referred to as the Great Enclosure, has walls as high as 11 m extending approximately 250 m. David Beach believes that the city and its proposed state, the Kingdom of Zimbabwe, flourished from 1200 to 1500, although a somewhat earlier date for its demise is implied by a description transmitted in the early 1500s to Joao de Barros. Its growth has been linked to the decline of Mpungabwe from around 1300, due to climatic change or the greater availability of gold in the hinterland of Great Zimbabwe. Traditional estimates are that Great Zimbabwe had as many as 18,000 inhabitants at its peak, however, a more recent survey concluded that the population likely never exceeded 10,000. In 1531, Vicente Pegadu, captain of the Portuguese garrison of Sofala, described Zimbabwe thus. Among the gold mines of the inland plains between the Limpopo and Zambezi rivers there is a fortress built of stones of marvelous size, and there appears to be no mortar joining them. This edifice is almost surrounded by hills, upon which are others resembling it in the fashioning of stone and the absence of mortar, and one of them is a tower more than 22 m high. The natives of the country call these edifices Simbeo, which according to their language signifies court, the ruins form three distinct architectural groups. They are known as the Hill Complex, the Valley Complex and the Great Enclosure. The Hill Complex is the oldest, and was occupied from the 9th to 13th centuries. The Great Enclosure was occupied from the 13th to 15th centuries, and the Valley Complex from the 14th to 16th centuries. Notable features of the Hill Complex include the Eastern Enclosure, in which it is thought the Zimbabwe birds stood, a high balcony enclosure overlooking the Eastern Enclosure, and a huge boulder in a shape similar to that of the Zimbabwe bird. The Great Enclosure is composed of an inner wall, encircling a series of structures and a younger outer wall. The conical tower, 5.5 m in diameter and 9 m high, was constructed between the two walls, 
the valley complex is divided into the upper and lower valley ruins, with different periods of occupation. There are different archaeological interpretations of these groupings. It has been suggested that the complexes represent the work of successive kings, some of the new rulers founded a new residence. The focus of power moved from the hill complex in the 12th century, to the great enclosure, the upper valley and finally the lower valley in the early 16th century. The alternative, structuralist, interpretation holds that the different complexes had different functions, the hill complex as an area for rituals, perhaps related to rain-making, the valley complex was for the citizens, and the great enclosure was used by the king. Structures that were more elaborate were probably built for the kings, although it has been argued that the dating of finds in the complexes does not support this interpretation, the most important artifacts recovered from the monument are the eight Zimbabwe birds. These were carved from a micaceous schist, soapstone, on the tops of monoliths the height of a person. Slots in a platform in the eastern enclosure of the hill complex appeared designed to hold the monoliths with the Zimbabwe birds, but as they were not found in situ it cannot be determined which monolith and bird were where. Other artifacts include soapstone figurines, one of which is in the British Museum, pottery, iron gongs, elaborately worked ivory, iron and copper wire, iron hose, bronze spearheads, copper ingots and crucibles, and gold beads, bracelets, pendants and sheaths. Glass beads and porcelain from China and Persia among other foreign artifacts were also found, attesting the international trade linkages of the kingdom. In the extensive stone ruins of the great city, which still remain today, include eight monolithic birds carved in soapstone. It is thought that they represent the battler eagle a good omen, protective spirit and messenger of the gods in Shona culture. 3. Ribbit Monaster The defensive fortress Ribbit Monaster was founded in 796 by Harthama Ibn Ayan, governor of Afrikia and leader of the Abbasid Caliphate. The Tunisian Ribbit is the oldest of a number of fortifications built by Arab invaders in North Africa. Along with the doctrine of Islam, monasteries newcomers brought with them a style of Islamic art and architecture that they incorporated into the walls of the Ribbit. Throughout the medieval period, the castle-like fortification expanded to include two inner courtyards, two mosques, a spiral staircase and multiple watchtowers with a view of the Gulf of Hammamet, founded in 796 by the Abbasid leader and the governor of Afrikia, Harthama Ibn Ayan. Several improvements and changes were introduced to the building throughout the medieval times, including the expansion carried out by Abu al-Qasim ibn Tamim in 966. Initially it was quadrilateral shaped and then renovated into a composition of four buildings with two inner courtyards. There's also a spiral stair of about a hundred steps leading to the watchtower where visual messages were exchanged at night with the towers of neighboring ribots. Many watchtowers were added between 11th and 13th, 17th and 19th centuries in order to accommodate the artillery. The towers are also climbable, allowing visitors to enjoy a view of the city and the beach, in addition to the small rooms dedicated to the worshipping Mujahideen who were performing prayer and meditation during their military duty, the Ribbit has two mosques, the largest of which hosts a unique collection of worshipping materials and traditional medieval industrial materials today. 4. Ksar of Eight Ben Hadu, located in the foothills on the southern slopes of the High Atlas in the province of Warzazat, the site of Eight Ben Hadu is the most famous Ksar in the Aunala Valley. The Ksar of Eight Ben Hadu is a striking example of southern Moroccan architecture. The Ksar is a mainly collective grouping of dwellings. Inside the defensive walls which are reinforced by angle towers and pierced with a baffle gate, houses crowd together, some modest, others resembling small urban castles with their high angle towers and upper sections decorated with motifs in clay brick, 
but there are also buildings and community areas. It is an extraordinary ensemble of buildings offering a complete panorama of pre-Saharan earthen construction techniques. The oldest constructions do not appear to be earlier than the 17th century, although their structure and technique were propagated from a very early period in the valleys of southern Morocco. The site was also one of the many trading posts on the commercial route linking ancient Sudan to Marrakesh by the DRA Valley and the Tizientelouet Pass. Architecturally, the living quarters form a compact grouping, closed and suspended. The community areas of the Ksar include a mosque, a public square, grain threshing areas outside the ramparts, a fortification and a loft at the top of the village, and caravanserai, two cemeteries, Muslim and Jewish, and the sanctuary of the Saint Sidi Ali or Amr. The Ksar of 8, Ben Hadou is a perfect synthesis of earthen architecture of the pre-Saharan regions of Morocco, the site of the Ksar has been fortified since the 11th century during the Almoravid period. None of the current buildings are believed to date from before the 17th century, but they were likely built with the same construction methods and designs as had been used for centuries before. The site's strategic importance was due to its location in the Aunala Valley along one of the main Trans-Saharan trade routes. The Tizientichka Pass, which was reached via this route, was one of the few routes across the Atlas Mountains, crossing between Marrakesh and the DRAA Valley on the edge of the Sahara. Other Kasbahs and Ksaur were located all along this route, such as the nearby Tamdot to the north. Today, the Ksar itself is only sparsely inhabited by several families. The depopulation over time is a result of the valley's loss of strategic importance in the 20th century. Most local inhabitants now live in modern dwellings in the village on the other side of the river, and make a living off agriculture and especially off the tourist trade. In 2011 a new pedestrian bridge was completed linking the old Ksar with the modern village, with the aim of making the Ksar more accessible and to potentially encourage inhabitants to move back into its historic houses. The Ksar is located on the slopes of a hill next to the Aunala River, Asif Aunala. The village's buildings are grouped together within a defensive wall that includes corner towers and a gate. They include dwellings of various size ranging from modest houses to tall structures with towers. Some of the buildings are decorated in their upper parts with geometric motifs. The village also has a number of public or community buildings such as a mosque, a caravanserai, a kasbah and the marabou of Sidi Ali or America, at the top of the hill, overlooking the Ksar, are the remains of a large fortified granary. There is also a public square, a Muslim cemetery, and a Jewish cemetery. Outside the Ksar's walls was an area where grain was grown and threshed, the Ksar's structures are made entirely out of rammed earth, adobe, clay bricks, and wood. Rammed earth was a highly practical and cost-effective material but required consistent maintenance. It was made of compressed earth and mud, usually mixed with other materials to aid adhesion. The structures of Eid Ben Hadou and of other Kasbahs and Ksaur throughout this region of Morocco typically employed a mixture of earth and straw which was relatively permeable and easily eroded by rain over time. As a result, villages of this type can begin to crumble only a few decades after being abandoned. At 8 Ben Hadou, taller structures were made of rammed earth up to their first floor while the upper floors were made of lighter adobe so as to reduce the load of the walls. The Ksar has been significantly restored in modern times, thanks in part to its use as a Hollywood filming location and to its inscription on the UNESCO list of World Heritage Sites in 1987. UNESCO reports that the Ksar has preserved its architectural authenticity with regard to configuration and materials by continuing to use traditional construction materials and techniques and by largely avoiding new concrete constructions. A local committee is in charge of monitoring and managing the site. 5. Citadel of Cape Bay 
The front edifice of the citadel of Cape Bay stands at royal attention on the eastern point of Pharos Island in the ancient city of Alexandria, Egypt. The citadel was built on the same spot as the Lighthouse of Alexandria, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world destroyed after a series of earthquakes between the 11th and 14th centuries, to protect the city from invading Turks in the 1480s. Its founder, a Circassian sultan by the name of Kate Bay, was an architecture aficionado who ultimately went on to build or renovate the edifices of 70 monumental structures in Egypt and others in Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem. Heavily damaged by the British in 1882, the Egyptian King Farouk restored the upper floors in 1904 for use as a royal vacation home. Today, the citadel houses Alexandria's Maritime Museum. The Cape Bay Citadel in Alexandria is considered one of the most important defensive strongholds, not only in Egypt, but also along the Mediterranean Sea coast. It formulated an important part of the fortification system of Alexandria in the 15th century AD. The citadel is situated at the entrance of the eastern harbor on the eastern point of Pharos Island. It was erected on the site of the former Lighthouse of Alexandria, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Many structural modifications were made to the lighthouse after the Arab conquest of Egypt, but the lighthouse continued to function for many centuries. Restoration began in the period of Ahmed ibn Tuluan, about 880 AD. During the 11th century an earthquake occurred, causing damage to the octagonal part. The bottom survived, but it could only serve as a watchtower, and a small mosque was built on the top. Two very destructive earthquakes occurred in 1303 and 1323, which resulted in the complete destruction of the lighthouse. About 1480 AD, the Circassian Mameluk Sultan Al-Ashraf Kate Bey fortified the place as part of his coastal defensive edifices against the Turks who were threatening Egypt at that time. He built the fortress and placed a mosque inside it. The citadel continued to function during most of the Mameluk period, the Ottoman period and the modern period, but after the British bombardment of Alexandria in 1882, it was kept out of the spotlight. It became neglected until the 20th century, when it was restored several times by the Egyptian Supreme Council of Antiquities, the founder of the citadel of Kate Bay is a Circassian sultan named Al-Ashraf Abu Anasir Saif Eldin Kate Bay al jerkasi al-Zahiri who was born about 1423 AD. He was a Mamluk who had come to Egypt as a young man, less than 20 years old. Bought by Al-Ashraf Burs Bay, he remained among his attendants until Al-Ashraf Burs Bay died. Then the Sultan Jack Mac bought Kate Bay and later gave him his freedom. Kate Bay then went on to occupy various posts. He became the chief of the army during the rule of the Sultan Timurbaga. When the Sultan was dethroned, Kate Bay was appointed as a Sultan who was titled Al-Malek Al-Ashraf on Monday 26th Ragab. 1468 AD Kate Bay was so fond of art and architecture that he created an important post among the administrative system of the state, it was the edifice's mason, Shady al -Amar. He built many beneficial constructions in Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem.